So when we look at sensitivity and specificity, we can look at those numbers and kind of see that it's not a great, great thing or it is a great thing. What you should have known from my Calc 2 grade that the Calc 2 scoring was actually really good. You can see that. You can also see that in the plot. The ROC curve looked almost like a rectangle. So the more it looks like a rectangle, the better your predictions are. So um, we can actually systematically tell this with a number. So we, we can't just say, hey, it looks almost like a rectangle. What do you think about that? That's not good enough. So you want some way to tell using a number how good your predictions are. And that's called the area under the curve. The area under the curve in regular math classes, if you're taking Calc 1, um, they would just they would talk about Riemann integration and do theory first. But what we're going to do is we're going to go the other way because most of you are life science majors interested in going into health science. They actually have a name for this. They call it AUC, the area under the curve. It's an acronym that apparently everybody in medicine knew, and I didn't know what it was. But as soon as I saw it, I'm like, I know what this is. This is integration. So let me show you, go, going back to the chart where we have 1 minus specificity and sensitivity on the axes. Um, our rock curves kind of look like that. And the first thing is the rock curve is a probability um, number. It's, it actually has something to do with probability. This line over here is the y equals x line. And I don't know if I've drawn this line in your rock curves with, with the rock curves. I usually draw it. Um, one of my co-authors wanted to get rid of it. And I told him, don't get rid of it. Because being above this line means that you're better than random guessing. Being below this line means that you're no better than random guessing. So that happens sometimes. The rock curves can appear below this line. And then you know that whatever you're trying to use as your marker for diagnosis has almost nothing to do with what you're trying to diagnose. So I've actually had um, graphs that have appeared below this. So I just tried it out and worked and it didn't work. So that's the first eyeball way that you could look at it and say, um, you know, the nodule size has nothing to do with having cancer. I'm, I'm making something up, but it's, it's kind of like that where you can actually tell looking at the graph that it's not a, a useful metric for diagnosing whatever you're diagnosing. But there's another way with a number. And the first thing you can say is um, if that rock curve, I call it like a bowstring, if you pull that rock curve back and it was these yellow lines, then it would be perfect. That's the perfect diagnosis. You'll never get that. The Calc 2 grades that I showed you when that formulated the rock curve was pretty close, actually. But most of the time, you don't even get close to those yellow lines. But the closer you are to those yellow lines, the better of a diagnosis you're making. And um, this, is, this is because if 1 minus specificity was 0, then specificity would be 1, and those would be very good um, specificities. And um, sensitivity would always be 1. So you're making a 100% diagnosis of your illness every single time, which isn't going to really happen. <clears throat> that shaded area, what's the area of that shaded region? It's 100%, right? How would I find the area of that region itself? Formulas. <laughs> it's a square. Length is what? Length times width. We're going back to formulas here. So what is the length of that shaded area? One, right? Because it's just distance one. One. One times one is one. You get the hundred percent. So logic meets formula, right? You want you have a hundred percent prediction. Uh, accuracy and the area under the curve is one, which is a hundred percent. So they match. So one times one is one. We learn something new to every day. Now this area is not one. It's less than one. The better my prediction is, the better my rock curve is, the closer that number is to being one. If it is below this line, it's below 50%. Because if I take this line and slice it by um, square and right in half, so half is 50%. That's a failing grade. So I actually said in one of my papers, it's a, it's a, it's a failing grade. It's an academic grade. If you get a 50 or below, you fail. If you get above a 50, you're starting to get somewhere. Six, above 50, you're in the B range. Above 70, C. You know, and you know what? I don't curve here, but I curve my own scores on the rock curve. So um, if I get a 79.9, I'm like, oh, it's, it's a C minus. <laughs> it's getting up there. I wouldn't 
haven't even used what, so let's suppose that you said, okay, I want to take the pre-calc scores and use it as a marker to tell people to drop after the second exam. Those are kind of scattered around. They weren't like the calc two scores. So maybe I'll make the rock curve and the entire rock curve will be below the um, y equals x line. What that tells me is that I'm better off just guessing who's going to have to drop than using the calc exam two scores to tell them. My belief is that if I actually do the graph, it's going to be slightly above, but it's not going to be fantastic like the calc two scores. So um, there, you can actually measure this. And that's, you do it by calculating the area underneath this curve and seeing what the academic grade is attached to it. So if you get a 70% failure, well, 70% accurate. You got a C minus. <laughs> so if you, they said to get rid of that from the paper, but that is what it is. They said it's true, what she, your writing is true, but you probably shouldn't put it in a science paper. So, uh, but that is what it is. So you'd like that shaded area to be as close to 100% or one as possible. That's what they call AUC, area under the curve. And that is what it is. So how do you actually find this? Well, the most simple way to find it, because it's not a rectangle, it's kind of this curve. The most simple way to find it is just to make a bunch of rectangles under it. And that's what most uh, software programs do. They just cut this thing up into rectangles and then calculate the areas of this rectangles. Um, and I didn't make perfect looking rectangles, but I made six rectangles. And um, the easiest way to do is make evenly spaced rectangles. So if it's zero to one, every one of the widths of these rectangles is going to have size one. If I cut it up into six pieces, what would the width be here? One six, right? Because I cut, the, I cut just the whole thing and I cut it up into six pieces. So this would, width would be one six. What would the height be? Well, notice that the height is touching the curve. So you just plug the x value into the curve to get the height. So now you have the height as well. So you can actually calculate the area of each one of these rectangles and add it up. So um, the area would be the total sum of approximately, I try to make wigglies, um, of these six rectangular areas. So I have six rectangles. The width of each one of those rectangles is one six because all the way across is one. I chopped it into six equal pieces. So each one of those rectangles would have width one six. Um, and you can kind of, you can see that with, even with my horrible drawing. So let's just take that first rectangle. I shaded it red. Um, in that first rectangle, the height of this rectangle is given by the rock curve itself because it's touching the curve. So I can give you the height by just taking the number 1, 6, which is the x value here, plugging it into the function, and that gives me the y value. That's f at 1, 6. So the area of the first rectangle, I can actually write down 1, 6 times f of 1, 6, which is not fun without a calculator, but you can do it. So I like putting myself in your shoes and saying, I'm not going to use the calculator to do this. The second rectangle, well, the second rectangle is just like the first rectangle. It has the width of 1, 6, but I had to go um, this number here. If this was 1, 6, then this is 2, 6, and that would be 3, 6, and that would be 4, 6, and 5, 6, and then 6, 6, because I chopped it into six equal pieces. So this point right here is one, uh, 2, 6, and I would plug 2, 6 into F whatever that function is. So the area of the total thing would be just adding them all up, approximately. And that would give me an approximate area of the curve, and then I could score myself. How well did my prediction do? How close was it to the number one? So let's do a real example with a real function so that you can see it. I, I was curious about this count two thing because it looks very close to a rectangle in the first place. So I'm going to bet that it's my area under the curve is close to one. And I, I'm just sloppy. If I'm just doing this for real without, I would just say, what was the minimum amount of pieces I'd need? I'd just chop it into two pieces to make my calculations easy. If you wanted to get a better estimate, you chop it up into six pieces, right? The more you cho refine chopping up you have, the better you're going to get. Because I have error. My error is right here, right? I'm going to have some error with one of these rectangles. So the area of the first piece is 1 half times f, time, uh, f of 1 half, and the area of the second one is 1 half times f of 2 halves. So because I'm plugging in 1 half in right here. So I can actually calculate this. f at 1 half um, is this thing right here. I just plug in 0.5, which is miserable without a calculator, but I did go to Excel and just plug it in and see if I'm getting the right thing. You get something.
something like 1.19608. Clear? F at two halves is 1.029703. You can just plug it in there and see what that number is. The area of the first piece is 0.5, that's the width, times F at one half, so that you get 0.509804. And one half times F at one is 0.54852. So I'm just doing that formula that I showed you in the previous, I'm just counting the areas of these rectangles. You don't even need a formula. You just need to know base times height. And then you add it up, and I got 1.02, and that's even bigger than one. Why would it be bigger than one when the area of the rectangle is one? I have my error. So it's pretty dang close to one. That's what I would say. So it's, it's a really, really good prediction. So now I can go to my Cal 2 students and tell them, I think you should drop the class because you got below the cut point of 55 on exam two. And they get, they'll turn around and say, are you telling me I'm going to fail the class? And I'll say, no, the data is telling me that you are probably going to fail the class. They might ask me, if they're in Calc 2, how sure are you of that? I'll say 99% sure. <laughs> I'm really, really sure, because that's the, what the area in the curve is telling me. So the numbers are telling me that, yeah, you have a 99% chance of failing this course if you have below 55 on exam two. Makes it much more systematic. Um, so, as you said, there's error, and the error exists. See the shaded pieces right here that I, I, I outlined? It's not underneath the curve, so that error exists. And um, so I'm counting that error in there, and I'd like to know the exact answer. So how can I reduce that error? How can I reduce that error? If I, I, if I didn't want those like pieces in there, what could I do? Huh? Say again? More rectangles. More rectangles. So I could make maybe 10 rectangles if I wanted less error. So that's it. Cut, cut more rectangles up. I have six here. Maybe I want 12 rectangles. And then I would not get as many pieces hanging over the curve as I had before. So that's what, you, that's what most programs do, software programs. They just do it by just cutting these rectangles up into pieces even finer. But mathematicians, they just have to generalize everything, right? So I can, I'm going to symbolically say I'm going to divide this thing into n rectangles, calculate the areas with the n in it, and then let n go to infinity. Take a limit, let it slide to infinity, and then I'll have the exact answer. And that's called an integral. So the area, I just do it systematically like this, 1 over n, f at 1 over n. I plug in one, this symbol 1 over n into my function, and I'll get an expression. I'll take f at 2 over n and plug it into the function, and then I'll get an expression with n. So I'll get this sequential expression like you had on exam 3, and exam 2, and exam 1, and then I'll just let n go to infinity, and that'll give me the exact answer. Which mathematicians seem to want. So when um, when Steve asks me, uh, you know, is your area under the curve right? I'll say, yeah, it's exactly right. It's exact because this is what I'll be doing. So that gives me that exact area, and there will be no error. So I can probably tell my Calc two students exactly the percent chance that they are going to fail the class if they're below a 55. So the quiz Monday, I'm going to give you some homework just to chop things into two or three pieces um, and just calculate the area using rectangles. I just want you to get familiar with that. I think the idea is very simple. Um, this video will be online so you can see how to do it. And um, I don't think you'll have any trouble with this. I'm not going to do that as a web assign. I'm just going to ask you to do it. And if you have issues with it, let me know. I don't think that there will be, actually. Oh, um, so if I have this right here, the x, the x value is going to marching in pieces of six, right? So the distance from here to here is one six. The distance from here to here is two six. Right, the x, uh, the x goes in a number line, and now just the number line is chopped into six pieces, right? So you're just, the x axis is actually the number line, right? So if you really want to teach a class of mathematics the right way, you first build a number line that goes across the floor with positives and negatives on it. So they get used to the idea that they're walking across the number, and you make it big enough so they can walk down with feet on top of it. So 
beginning when you go to my house now. <laughs> and then, give me a second break, we put another number one to our business. And so they always look at graphing as now walking across number one. much into the theory. I'm just going to show you a flash into the theory. We're going to end a little early today. I don't want to do too much right after the test. Um, so I want to just give you some homework calculating some areas by estimation under the curves. Um, but the idea is that um, if you have an area, you can actually do this like cutting up and let delta x be 1 over n. And letting n go to infinity is the same thing as letting delta x go to 0. Same exact thing. And the area turns out to be the, the limit as delta x goes to 0 of all these pieces. So it's like I'm squeezing delta x down. So you're just taking those widths and making your rectangles more and more narrow as you go. It turns out, I'm going to take a long story and make it very short. It turns out that the derivative of the area is equal to that function, that rock curve function. So if you wanted to find the area itself, antichrist, antiderivative. You want to go the opposite way. So you take that function that's f of x, and you find the place where its derivative came from. So you're going the other way. Instead of taking the derivative, like using power rules, you want to go backwards. And so you're thinking backwards from what you already learned in class forward. So um, that's the next thing that we're going to do, and that's the last topic we're going to do as content area in this class. We're just going to learn how to go backwards in the other direction. It's not really that important to know it as a skill, because Mathway does it. Not just Mathway, there's Wolfram Alpha, which is a more sophisticated version of Mathway on, online. And even your app, there's apps on your phone that you can download that you can tell to integrate. Somebody, does anybody have the Inspire calculator in here? You can do it. So my son has that, and he wouldn't refuse to learn. I'm like, do you know what's done with all these things? And it looks just like the other TI. You can quietly go into class with this thing and check all your work. So it's fantastic. It will do all this for you. So I'm not going to really focus too much on techniques of integration. I'll show you some, and then expect you to do some, but you'll know exactly what they are, the, the, the things that you have to know for just transforming an, a rock curve. And we'll always do rock curves. There's no reason to go and do applications at this point that we're never going to see again. Everything that um, I've seen Dirk van der Klein has used integrals, they're always definite integrals. That means they're finding an area under a curve. So you guys don't do half of what we do in the math, math world, and you don't need to. So are there any questions on this? I'll be posting the Canvas thing on Canvas. I'll be posting like maybe five homework problems where you're just calculating with rectangles. I'll tell you, chop it up in two pieces or three pieces compute the areas of those rectangles. And then I will give you the project. So if your grades are fairly high, you know, on all the uh, exams, you can choose to do that project.